Alright, good morning students. Uh, this is the second lesson in our chapter on, uh, this chapter is about energy resources and we'll talk about pollution as well, you know, later on, something about pollution. So let's continue. This is all about renewable energy resources, okay? So you probably already knew this, you know, even the non-renewable energies, I'm sure a lot of that was review for some of you. Uh, so a renewable energy resource is just one that can't run out. And the reason it can't run out is because there's some kind of process in the environment that is constantly renewing it, or it's being replenished all the time. Okay, so renewable energies can't run out, all right? The first type that uh, some of you may have is on your house, or you've seen them places on people's houses, maybe a friend's house. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, it's a solar panel. So solar panels are made up of solar cells. You know, that's an individual solar cell. You can see it looks all like, uh, like crystals in there. Okay. And, uh, right, sunlight comes down from the sun and hits the solar cell and it's converted into electricity. Solar cells can be on top of houses. They also can be uh, on a solar farm. So you can see this is in the desert. Obviously, the desert is a great place to have solar panels, to have a solar farm, because the, well, the sun's always out. Something to keep in mind about solar energy, if there's no sunlight, you can make electricity. If it's a cloudy day, rainy day, you're really not generating a lot of electricity. And obviously, at nighttime, you can't make electricity. So one thing that's wonderful about uh, non-renewable energy is, is that it doesn't matter what time of day it is, you can always charge your devices, you can always run an appliance. You know, humans can continue running their lives basically 24-7 uh, in all the ways we use electricity, and that's why non-renewables are great. Renewable energy, unfortunately, while it's better for the environment in most cases, you know, it's not an on-demand service. It's only there while you have it, and solar energy is one, is one that's like that. This is a map. This is actually a really cool map. It's photovoltaic solar resource. That just means basically where in the United States will you see the most sunlight? Where can solar panels get the most for their buck? Because they are pretty expensive. And it's pretty obvious where it is. It's in the southwest United States, Arizona, New Mexico, uh, parts of Nevada, and Southern California. You can see where we are up in New York. Um, it's not terrible, but if you're comparing that with what's, you know, what can be gotten in the Southwest, there's just no comparison. And again, the big thing is they're, they're located more south, the sun is very strong, and it's a desert, so you don't get that cloud cover. You can see Alaska is a miserable place for solar panels. Alaska is way too far north. The sun is not that strong most of the time, uh, especially in the winter. You know, in the winter time, it's lousy. So it's not really a good investment. Hawaii, though, is actually pretty good. So Hawaiians using solar panels to make electricity, very, very good idea. All right, next energy source is wind. Now, wind energy is collected from the kinetic energy of moving air. So the kinetic energy in the air is what's powering the wind turbine and it's what makes it actually move. Um, the most famous wind farms in the United States are probably in California. I've actually seen these myself. This is in uh, Palm Springs, California. It's quite incredible to see for yourself. Uh, there are easily, I don't know, 300 uh, you know, wind turbines, you know, maybe 500 just they're absolutely everywhere. It's a crazy, crazy sight to see. Uh, another cool map. This is showing where is the best place in the United States to get wind energy from. And you can see it's nothing like the map we saw with solar potential. And if you can tell from this map, offshore is the best place. Offshore. So off of the west coast of the United States, especially where it's blue and red. Those are the best places. Uh, so you can see the East Coast all along the water there, very, very strong. And there are plenty of spots 
on the interior of the United States, so South Dakota, North Dakota, lots of really strong wind. You can see here, in this part of the United States, uh, not that great. I mean, the data is actually not shown there, but there's a lot of mountains there, and mountains are really not going to get, you're not going to get some serious wind. You can see here in the Great Lakes, really good opportunities, you know, over here, you know, even in New York, uh, Lake Ontario would be an excellent place for some wind uh, turbines. Alaska has some good locations, and Hawaii has some good locations too. So, yeah, uh, hydroelectric is the next one. This is uh, collected from moving water. So the kinetic energy of moving water, it's pretty simple. I'm going to go through the process. A dam is built that builds up water high on one side of the dam. So the water is lifted up artificially from the dam. And that reservoir is a lot of potential energy, right? The water is high up, right? The higher you are off the ground, the more gravitational potential energy you have. That then is converted to kinetic energy as gravity pulls on the water. It travels through what's called the penstock. The penstock leads to a turbine. The turbine spins from that incredibly fast moving water. The turbine is connected to a generator. The generator then spins and that generates the potential difference and that allows electrons to flow. And that's electricity, you know, electrons flowing. The rest of the water just exits out into the river. So dams are built along rivers. This is the Colorado River. The Hoover Dam was built along the Colorado. And you can see how that dam has artificially raised the water table or has raised up the level of the river back here. And the water level on the other side of the dam is much, much lower. Now it's hard to tell from this image, but that is a very steep drop. I believe it's more than 500 feet. It might even be up to like 700 feet. So that's a very, uh, that's, a, that's a serious drop. And that difference allows potential energy to be converted to kinetic energy, and the hydroelectric dam captures that. The last type that we're, that we're going to go over uh, is geothermal. Geothermal utilizes heat or thermal energy from deep inside the earth. And it's pretty straightforward how it works. This, this GIF here is actually showing us really well what's happening. The, the hot water is pumped up and it's instantly flashed into steam. So that hot water is not, you know, it's so hot. Uh, and so when it comes up to the surface, it instantly turns to a vapor. It's depressurized, so it turns to a vapor and it hits a turbine and it spins a turbine, which then spins a generator and makes electricity. Now, once that water is cooled down, it's actually pumped, in some cases, back down into the earth, where it's then heated again and then brought back up. Okay, so that will never run out. You know, for as long as humans are around, uh, for as long as the earth has heat, which is anticipated to be another billion or so years, that energy will always be there. It will never run out. Really famous locations for geothermal is Iceland. That's uh, you know really, really well-known location. This is a geothermal power plant that's sitting right next to a hydrothermal uh, pool where people can go swimming. You, know, you can go to Iceland, go to the Blue Lagoon. Uh, lots of my friends have been there. You, you pay a, you know some money, you know, it's a tourist trap. So you pay money and you can sit in the geothermal waters. The air temperature could be 40 degrees, 30 degrees, and this water is really, really warm. Again, it's being warmed by the earth. It's a big thing to do in Iceland. They're also famous in Japan. Japan has lots of geothermal energy. Uh, they have lots of volcanoes, so the magma deep underneath the uh, earth heats the water. Iceland's famous for it. Uh, Northern California has some locations. Uh, there are hot spots kind of all over the world where this can be utilized. This is a graph showing global renewable energy consumption. The unit of energy is something we haven't learned yet. It's terawatt hours. That's a lot of electricity. It's tera. Tera is trillion. So uh, quite a bit of energy there, terawatts. And you can see how, you now you know, we didn't talk about biofuels, but biofuels 
Uh, those are fuels that are made from corn or other uh, plants. That still is the majority of our renewable energy resource, you know, just making fuels from plants. Hydro, uh, hydropower has been used for a very, very long time, going back to the Industrial Revolution to power factories. And you can see how things like wind, solar are a bit newer on the scene. You know, those have just picked up steam in the last, say, 10 years, as well as some other renewable energies have picked up in the last 10 years. But you can see how these two dominate renewable energies. And of course, renewable energies make up an incredibly small percentage of all the energy sources that we use to make electricity. Um, coal, oil, natural gas, uh, the gray, the blue, and the purple make up, yeah, like 90% of this entire chart. The renewable energies make up a very small portion. You can see crude oil alone, you know, is accounting for, you know, in the hundreds of thousands of terawatts. You know, that is nothing compared to the tens of thousands, uh, you know, or so. So again, Non-renewable energies are still dominating because they're ultra-reliable. We generate a lot of electricity from them, and you can have the energy 24-7. You don't have to worry about the sun not being out, the wind not blowing. Uh, you know, it's higher, it's high-density energy that we've used for a long time. So they're definitely here to stay for a little while longer, but the future is definitely looking more green and looking more renewable you know, as time goes on. Okay, that's today's video lesson. Uh, I will see you for the next one.